Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and we're back with Dr. Stefan Gluck, professor of medicine at University of Miami, and now we're going to discuss the management of stage four metastatic triple negative breast cancer. All right, Dr. Gluck, let's say a patient presents to you with either newly diagnosed or recurrent, now stage four metastatic triple negative breast cancer. What does that mean, and what do you tell the patient? Well, um Obviously, it's a very unfortunate situation, both if it starts uh, as a stage four or if it recurs and becomes stage four after stage one or two or three. Uh, what it means is that the cancer spread to other parts of the body than breast and axilla on the same side. So it goes someplace else. So first of all, I tell them the bad news. The bad news is this cancer now is incurable. And if you turn it around even more negative, it means incurable disease eventually kills the patient. So that's the bad news you need to give your patients to start with. For a simple reason, we cannot tell them, oh, everything is okay, because it's not. But then, as a next sentence, I almost always use the phrase, tell me, do you know who is curing diabetes? And suddenly the patient starts to understand, oh my gosh. They're not curing diabetes, but they are treating mm -hmm. diabetes. So what it means now, and I tell her then, really, in these words, now you will have a disease which is chronic, which always needs some kind of a treatment or other, like diabetes, everyday diet, everyday pills, mm -hmm. everyday insulin. And some treatments work very well for a while, mm -hmm. but if they don't work, it doesn't mean that they don't work, it only means this treatment doesn't work and we choose the next one for you. So similar like diabetes, insulin doesn't work, you increase the dose, you take a different uh, brand, you do <coughs> different duration of the insulin, and instead of once, you inject twice or three times. So we will play with our therapy options that we have for you and we'll try to do two things. Extend, mm -hmm. prolong life, yeah. and second, improve or maintain high quality of life. How does the performance status of the patient affect your decision tree? Yeah, performance status means how well the patient actually is doing regarding with her cancer. Now, if the triple negative breast cancer comes into the lung, for example, because I had a patient recently who had hit in the lung, and she had three or four small lesions in the lung. She doesn't know it, and she doesn't feel it, mm -hmm. but we do an x-ray and we do a biopsy and it's proven to be breast cancer. So her performance status is 100%. Mm -hmm. So this is a different type of tumor as if she had the same type of metastatic disease, but these are big bulky tumors in the middle of the lungs, between the two lungs, mm -hmm. in the middle field, or mediastinal as they call it, and causes cough, shortness of breath, uh, fluid in the lungs. So these are things where the patient may have 50% or less than 50% performance status that she needs to be admitted to the hospital. Uh -huh. And this will direct and drive my uh, treatment decisions also. The more aggressive the tumor induces symptoms, the more aggressive my therapy will be, and vice versa. So this one woman that I had for a number of years with small lesions in the lung, biopsy proof, I did not treat her at all. Mm -hmm. I dared not to treat her. And for two and a half years, maybe two years and three months, she was completely okay. And then the tumor started growing, and then we treated her. That makes sense. How do you address pain associated with cancer? Yeah, um, both my nurse practitioner and I, we have a very good agreement. Every type of symptom that is associated with cancer or cancer treatment must be aggressively treated. In other words, if a patient has nausea or vomiting, we give the best and highest possible drugs. If she has pain, we do not wait. We give her anti-analgesics, uh, um, uh, uh, so drugs against the pain as much as possible, as fast as possible. The worst what can expect, be expected with a patient with pain is pain on, pain off, pain on, pain off. This is the roller coaster. This is not a good treatment. She needs to be pain-free or at least low with pain at all times. So I use a lot of long-acting drugs mm -hmm. as a base and then some breakthrough in between if necessary. Oftentimes our patients take alternative herbal medicines. What do you think about that and do you allow the use? Yes, uh, my estimation is that CAM 
complementary and alternative medicine is used particularly in breast cancer in up to 80 to 90 percent of all cases. And uh, because I believe uh, most people at least explore it, I always mention it also and I had a case this morning and ask so did you hear and do you use and are you intending to use? What I then try to do, being educated on one side, but to look into potential interaction with the treatments that I'm prescribing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying don't take this, I'm telling them, look, the science proves that this is what we should be doing. There are some less scientific but interesting alternatives. But before you take those, talk to me if there's a negative interaction. Mm -hmm. There are a few drugs that do interact with tamoxifen or chemotherapy, or some of our drugs are oxidants mm -hmm. or antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. as you already hear, some of the oxidants that they take might actually avoid or mm -hmm. abolish the efficacy of treatment. So I look carefully what they bring me, and then we'll decide. You can take this, but don't take that. Do you prefer using two chemotherapies at the same time or one at a time? Yeah, it's a very important question. and This has been a controversy uh, in uh, circles of medical oncology for a while. Actually, the best answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it depends exactly on the same thing as I mentioned before. Lots of symptoms, you want to get rid of the symptoms fast. Mm -hmm. You use two, sometimes even three drugs at the same time. Mm -hmm. Little or no symptoms, use the least possible and least toxic, only one drug. I see. How do you address uh, nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy? Yeah, as I said mm -hmm. before, I take it very seriously because uh, metastatic risk is incurable, meaning the patient doesn't have 20, 30 years to live. So every day counts, mm -hmm. and the day with nausea doesn't count, so I need to give her something strong, the best that we have. And yeah, a good, a good type of drugs in the meanwhile to avoid uh, nausea and vomiting, and if it happens, to treat it. I see. Uh, what if a patient has no appetite? How do you address that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a more difficult thing. Uh, there are, of course, drugs also that can help with appetite, but the best in breast cancer, the best cure for appetite or loss of appetite is to have the cancer under control. Mm -hmm. Usually when the cancer is under control with whatever we do, then the appetite comes back. And how do you follow and monitor to see whether the treatment that you're rendering is working or not? Yeah, that's a very subtle uh, uh, and acquired um, almost art. Mm -hmm. because. Of course, you cannot do scans, CT scan or bone scans or PET scans every two, three months. If the patient lives, let's say, five years, how many scans did you do? So you may do more harm than good. Blood tests usually don't help too much. They sometimes do when they're so-called proteins that you can measure in the blood. They are called tumor markers, but they are not really tumor markers. They are vaguely associated with tumor growth. And there are also so-called circulating tumor cells, which means the tumor that is growing somewhere in the body can shed off some of those cells and you can find it in the blood. But again, it's only 50%, so they are not reliable. Mm -hmm. The best the best guess how treatment works is, how is the patient doing? In spite of the so-called bad chemo, actually she starts to feel better, then you know yeah. it's working against the cancer, and vice versa. But then, of course, occasionally you do not know, then you need to do a scan, and then you don't know, you can sometimes help with a tumor marker, and occasionally it gives you a good answer. Sometimes <clears throat> uh, family members ask us not to discuss the prognosis or the cancer with a patient. How do you address that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, these are mostly patients from specific um, groups, uh, at least here in Miami, Latin American uh, people and also islanders. And it's most of the time they are elderly, 70s, 80s, even 90s. Now because our treatment, and we're talking about triple negative breast cancer still, our treatments are so toxic, you cannot tell them, you know, you have nothing special, I give you something very toxic. So it's very difficult. So first I meet with the family, if they, because usually they pull you out without a patient. I say, look, our treatment will be substantial. Now in estrogen positive breast cancer, I give them tamoxifen, and a 90 or 85 year old lady taking a pill of tamoxifen without knowing that it's cancer, that's okay, mm -hmm. but chemotherapy not. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the primary breast tumor should be removed if someone has metastatic disease? Yeah, I think that has been another very important question. Uh, because one believes, and it's true, that stage four breast cancer is incurable, many of uh, my colleagues in the past thought, okay, if it's in the liver, what does it do if you remove it in the breast? Why do chemotherapy? 
radiation, and even surgery. So there are a number of analyses. These are retrospective studies. They have not been prospectively done. And two of the biggest ones are from Europe, uh, from the ERTC uh, in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, and from MDNS in, in Houston in the United States. And they are about the same. Several hundred patients were identified. If stage four breast cancer had a good response to treatment, and then they removed the primary cancer, actually these women lived longer. Mm -hmm. In other words, even in stage four breast cancer, one should remove the primary cancer. You do not need to advise for total mastectomy or for a axillary clearance, but at least lumpectomy or tumorectomy or excisional biopsy should be done. Okay. Would you comment on bone protecting agents such as bisphosphonates or denosumab in the yes. management? Yeah. So although <clears throat> uh, triple negative breast cancer is slightly less likely, not much, but less likely to go into the bone in contrast to estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, it still goes to the bones. Mm -hmm. And although bone uh, metastases are not so much life-threatening, but they can be extremely painful and dangerous. Why so? First of all, the bone is weaker, so it can break. So I have seen patients who have just did like this here, and they break the arm mm. because it's so, the bone is so weak. Uh, the uh, bone in the spine can break and they can be paralyzed. So in the last, I want to say about 30 years now, uh, a number of agents were developed, the group of bisphosphonates and more recently uh, monoclonal antibodies. And what they have shown, that they not only reduce the pain associated with bone metastasis, but also protect the bone from breaking and if it cannot protect, it delays substantially the time to such an event uh, by actually many months, if not years. The Nosumab is a new drug uh, which is a monoclonal antibody against uh, some uh, substances that uh, lead to bone destruction and have been shown in um, three large randomized trials to be even better than bisphosphonates. So most of the time one can administer these drugs. This can be pills, this can be IV infusions, or in form of denosumab, uh, it can be a subcutaneous injection every four weeks. Would you please explain what are clinical <coughs> trials, and do you recommend clinical trials yeah. for patients? Yeah. Clinical trials is what and how we learn whether a treatment is effective, whether it's toxic, whether it's safe, and whether it's better what we have done in the past. So this is a s sequence of trials. And we do clinical trials stage one, or phase one, phase two, and phase three. In the phase one, we look at new compounds, mm -hmm. and not only compounds, it can be new radiation, it can be new surgical techniques. Is it safe? How should we be given? And is it also somewhat effective? If it f does not fail, such a trial, and says, well, it's promising, then we bring it to the phase two trial, and the phase two trial looks at, oh, okay, it is not toxic or not excessively toxic, is it effective? So we will do maybe 20, maybe 50, maybe 120 patients on such a trial. They become subjects, remember? Um, and if it's true that this trial in the phase two study shows good efficacy or promising efficacy with acceptable or no or little toxicity, then you go to a phase three trial. Phase three trial takes half of the patient or one third of the patient and assigns them randomly to standard treatment, whatever it is. It can be no treatment, but it can be very toxic treatment. And the other part of these patients are assigned to receive the experimental treatment. If the experimental treatment turns out to be better, or at least as good but less toxic, then it becomes the new standard. What are your thoughts regarding palliative care and hospice in patients with stage 4 breast cancer? When do you recommend it? Well, there are two things to say. Uh, palliative care and hospice is the Basically, the second worst thing I can tell to a patient, the first thing is the devastation of a relatively healthy person to tell them you have incurable disease and ultimately will die. And the second, next worst thing is to, to tell them now it's time. So what I'm trying to prepare is the patient and her family early, not too early, but early in a disease, not until it's too, too late, to make sure that she understands this. So. For example, when you have a woman who had successfully completed one treatment, did well for a year, then she progressed or recurred again, then they did a second treatment, did well for, let's say, eight months, and so on and so forth. But now we are in the fourth, fifth year, which can easily happen, and my treatments 
that I have do not work anymore. So before she gets in a very bad shape, or he, then I tell them, look, it's time to talk to hospice. It's time to think about everything, to bring everything in order, will, living will, talk to family and friends. And it very often helps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's part of the physician, to be, a, to be a good physician, that even in bad and difficult times, you actually can help, even if you cannot save them. And then when you as a physician and I as a physician uh, have a husband who after the death of his wife comes back to you and say, thank you for the time, for the difficult time you helped us through it, then you know you have done something right. So it's really all the way down. Thank you. I think the, the theme is that even though cure might not be possible, hope is yes. not lost. Correct. Thank you so much, Dr. Blue. We hope that this was educational for you as well. Thank you.